Uh, you mentioned a little bit about my back. And I just wanted to mention that I'm in a big advocate of um, uh, standards, and I'm also very much involved in a lot of the NoSQL community and trying to promote education, uh, helping match the right uh, business problems with the right NoSQL database. Uh, my wife, Ann Kelly, and myself are authors of a book uh, being published by Manning. You can actually get it today, uh, from Manning.com slash McCurry. Uh, and our goal is to have about a 40-hour curriculum to solution architects come up to speed to recommend the right solutions. Uh, we're only going to cover a little bit of the book today, uh, but if you're curious, you go to Manning.com slash McCurry and download the entire uh, uh, first chapter, and then you can purchase the book in PDF, and it will be available in print. We're looking at the of August. So, so let's talk about what we're going to cover today. Uh, our focus is really going to be on understanding architectural patterns that are introduced by the NoSQL and really look at what problems they address uh, and match the right business problems with the right patterns. Uh, to make everybody kind of aware of what's going on here, uh, I think in the 80s and early 90s, we saw relational databases as uh, kind of the dominant form of the dominant database pattern. And then in 1995 towards uh, two, 2010, we saw a database where uh, that used this OPA analytical model. Now we're starting to see the third slice of the pie emerging, and that's what we call the NoSQL world. Um, before the NoSQL movement, we really kind of had two dominant patterns in most databases. We had this additional pattern uh, where we put uh, data enabled, something called the row store pattern, uh, where each, every time you add rows to a table, um, uh, you get a consistent set of uh, records. Uh, and the columns, we I drew, drew them in different colors, mean that they're all the same data type. Um, so that's kind of the, the traditional SQL relational database. Uh, the second that was really uh, common was this analytical, or often called the OLAP pattern. And there we have a central fact table with maybe a history of all your transactions. And on the edge, you have the star schema uh, that has all the dimensions, such as time and product and things like that. And it was similar to the relational that you stored data in tables, but unlike the relational, you had a different language, you used the language MDX, and really focused not on transactions, but on doing uh, analysis of historical data. So uh, the problem was that a lot of uh, people were using these patterns, but they broke in certain areas. They broke in stability. Uh, they didn't have the document-centric. Um, you had to do a lot of data modeling up front. Um, so there's a lot of different uh, pressures, and we're not going to really spend a lot of time on the uh, historical drivers for NoSQL. But what we really want to say is that we've now added four patterns to the traditional two, starting out with relational and I'll go, but we've added in Kelly stores, town family stores, uh, stores, and document stores. And so what we're, we're talking about for this hour is these four new patterns. We're not going to spend a lot of time on relational and analytical, like I mentioned where their strengths are, uh, but we're going to go into each of these four new ones and talk about where uh, they're, what types of business problems they're best at solving. So when you think of key value stores, um, the, the icon in the upper right, right there really shows that uh, keys are uh, basic small strings. And then I often uh, display the values in terms of black uh, opaque values. That is, you can't really see what's inside the values. I focus on putting uh, things like a URL uh, in a key, um, and then uh, the blob of data would be in the value. Very simple uh, structure. It doesn't have complex language. Um, and and uh, so we'll talk about how that uh, is one of the things. The no next one we talk about is column family stores. And I think about this as keys in a matrix. We'll go through and describe all that. But basically, each one of these cells in a very large table, these can be millions of rows uh, and millions of columns. And you can't really say select all columns very quickly because uh, they may be distributed over the area network. Uh, that's the types of things that you're starting to see in Cassandra and HBase. Uh, the uh, third new uh, NoSQL pattern is the graph. 
Uh, and this have actually been around for quite a while. Uh, and uh, the uh, characteristic of that is that you're focusing on the relationships between data and graph traversals. Uh, and then the last one is document stores. Document stores are, are kind of one of the more popular ones. They're the ones that are really um, promoting agile development and search and retrieval. And in documents, we have a hierarchy of objects that are kind of clustered together in logical groupings. So we're going to go through each of these, kind of uh, find sh which ones are useful in different areas. All right, so uh, why is this important to understand these? In, in the past, it seems like a lot of organizations I went to uh, and did consulting seemed like they had a, a very binary world. If it looked at a document, they'd say, let's put it in Microsoft Office or a spreadsheet. If it was a little bit bigger than a document or didn't fit well, then they said, let's hire a team of monitors and do relational uh, data. We'll create our data definitions, and we'll do that. And it was a big project. Now what we're starting to see is that we have a lot of different types of data nowadays, uh, and we have a lot of it. Uh, this is kind of getting you familiar with the fact that there's not just transactional data. But we have on the left-hand side a lot of uh, read-only data, uh, or we write once and read many times, not just databases, uh, analytical databases, but also lots of log files and events. The one event in a very large log file is critical, and it needs to bubble to the top quickly. I have a lot of unstructured data, uh, documents, XML, and JSON. We have lots of open link data. And we're starting to see that each of these different systems handles different types of data well and so can be configured in different ways uh, and using different types of hardware to be optimized. Uh, there are different types of data. There's also different types of uses of these. Uh, we're going to see not just transactions and analysis for the first two, but now people want to do very high quality Google-like search and findability analysis. They make changes very quickly. They want to discover and find insights in large volumes of data. They want speed and reliability. They're starting to do streaming things where they never store it to disk, and it only goes through memory. But they still want that consistency and availability that they get in transactional databases. One of the things that we found is that when people select the right pattern, sometimes they are unconsciously steered towards existing solutions that they're very familiar with. And I just attended um, the Carnegie Mellon Saturn conference, some wonderful uh, presentations about uh, uh, about why people tend to pick these old relational and analytical systems rather than looking at the new ones. Uh, they're anchored to the old systems. Uh, they, there's the wagon effect. Uh, they're only looking at a subset of the information out there. Uh, so there's all these different biases. We could spend an entire hour just talking about uh, people are still deciding to use these uh, systems. Uh, and I have a blog post about these, but um, uh, what I want to do is try to overcome some of the selection bias and help people get more information so they can pick the right solutions. One of the things I have to remind people is that many NoSQL solutions have a radically different architecture like these key value stores. Uh, they don't necessarily have to be conformant with all these ANSI SQL uh, standards and uh, uh, that they take one task and try to do that very well. And sometimes they really focus on scalability. Uh, my favorite example is Amazon Dynamo, uh, which is um, a very simple key value store uh, at its core. But it so scales. And uh, Amazon will give you 44 million transactions per free uh, because they really want to show off their scalability. So sometimes having a simple query language or a very simple interface helps you excel in other areas about NoSQL systems is that simplicity has really become a design style. People are looking at the entire code base of the product they're using, and they're throwing things out. They say, you know, we don't really need uh, transactional control. We don't need all the same ACID guarantees. We need all these uh, update things. Uh, we just want to have one database, just like an, a touch screen has one interface, and we want to repurpose it for multiple things. So that, that simplicity design style is very popular. Um, I, I wanted to make sure that everybody knows that this is just a little trend. Uh, if you go and look at the Google Trends uh, and search for both NoSQL and RDBMS, you'll find that NoSQL is really uh, growing quite a bit. And 
um, and RDMS uh, articles and blogs are starting to flatten out. Uh, this is really something that's becoming a mainstream uh, development. But it's thing that you want to just take your relational database problems, your, your general ledger accounting systems, and your um, uh, e-systems, and say, let's move it over to, to uh, uh, NoSQL. Um, systems are often uh, highly tuned and highly designed to be optimized for a certain type of uh, online transactions. Uh, the whole point of this is to look at areas that, that those systems weren't designed around. Like Aaron, Eric Evans from Rackspace, who has been very influential in this movement, uh, has a very good point that the whole point of this is to look for problems that don't fit well into relational databases. Um, there are a lot of companies. If you come to our conference uh, in at the end of August, uh, you'll uh, meet a lot of these vendors. Um, they're all taking very different approaches, but one of them you find is that they have a lot of innovative approaches to both scalability and agility, as well as uh, interesting ways of doing things such as streaming uh, data. So a lot of different companies, and I've tried to group some of them in uh, the, the level taxonomy we have for database architectures, uh, but often move around. For example, Couchbase uh, here, which is a document store is in the upper right, uh, to be a key, mostly a key value store, and they just added the JSON uh, functionality in their latest re release. So they're much more firmly in that document store camp. Um, we often see uh, new products being uh, started up in key simple key value stores, and then they add more and more features so they can have more complicated structures that can be queried. Um, so let's now go through these patterns and start to look at where they're good at. I'm going to just mention relational very quickly. Most people probably are familiar with Oracle and MySQL, Postgres, and the Microsoft SQL servers and IBM DB2. And are uh, good examples of very solid uh, relational databases that all adhere to standard language. Uh, but to use them, you need to do a lot of upfront data modeling. Um, as you do that, you, you're going to be using processes called joins to merge data, data from multiple tables. Um, and they are very mature. They have very good control of uh, transactions and fine-grained security. So you can allow a subgroup of people to see certain columns and certain rows in these tables. But it requires upfront modeling. And they also tend to have a challenge with scaling. And just to, to help people visualize that, if you have, have um, a distributed database and you have your products on one database and or one server in your network, and your um, uh, or another, you're going to have to do a join operation over the network, and those join operations send data back and forth between the servers. So what NoSQL kind of tries to do is say, let's avoid moving data across networks. What would happen if we kind of had orders and and products kind of grouped on these servers, and we sent the queries uh, off the network? Uh, so instead of moving data back and forth, we move queries back and forth. So it shows you a, a little bit different approach. Um, the things that NoSQL systems tend to be used for a lot is highly uh, available systems and highly scalable systems. But shouldn't forget the fact that most of the people that are doing high-end analytics already have very good tools in place that work and solve business problems very well. And I'm talking about companies like Cognos or Hyperion. MicroEnergy, uh, Pentaho has a very good open source uh, data warehouse system these days. Uh, Microsoft Oracle and, and Business Objects all have very, very good analytical systems. As I mentioned, these are based on this concept of a star system. They're really uh, analyzed for read mostly um, and very fast and allow non-technical users to be able to do queries by simply dragging and dropping things like categories and measures uh, using a graphical interface. Uh, that means that these systems aren't really optimized for transactions and updates, and they don't really deal with document stores that well. You can't really go in and, and do uh, keyword searches on uh, full text uh, databases. So they certainly have their place. Uh, and now let's go into uh, some of the big uh, patterns. So we talked about key value stores, uh, and uh, the examples of key value stores would be uh, or, uh, System the Berkeley DB that has actually been around uh, for quite a long time as part of the uh, initial uh, uh, Unix Berkeley releases. Uh, system Memcache, uh, DynamoDB, uh, S3, Redis, and React are all good examples 
of uh, solid key value storage systems. Um, what is important about these key value stores is that you really get to manipulate see the values in the key. And the design so that, that given a key, it returns a value very quickly. And uh, if you have lots and lots of key values, very quickly uh, They tend to be very scalable, uh, but they don't really have complex query languages. So let's take some metaphors. That if you're from this table, uh, you think of a table as uh, a place where as a table that has only two columns. The first would be a simple string, and then the second would be a blob. We're storing any time types of byte arrays in that value. Uh, and the key about this is you're not going to be joined, doing joins. You can certainly use relational databases to store key value stores uh, initially and then migrate them to services uh, if you want to. So you can always uh, kind of build a hybrid approach to these things. The way to look at it is uh, think of a, a locker metaphor. A locker metaphor is you can see all the keys that you have, but you're never going to be able to open up and see values inside of it unless you are, you are presented as the key. If you don't have the key, you can't get the values out of it. So it's a very uh, strict and, and uh, rigid system uh, unless you have a small data set where you're going to be uh, doing string analysis of those values. Um, so key values are very much like dictionaries, uh, where the key is something like uh, uh, the, uh, the entry dictionary and the value are all of the definitions uh, used uh, in the entire term of the dictionary would be the value. Um, so think of a relational database as you often think of, I, can, I have a set of uh, items and I can collect any subset of those items, uh, adding things like where clauses to your queries. Well, key values have a different model. Uh, you can only grab one item at a time out of your store, and uh, you can only do it given the key. Now, there are a lot of variations of this. So people will, uh, Sorted keys, and maybe have uh, other keys that contain uh, or other values that have that contain a collection of keys uh, to build a pseudo folder structure. But in fact, this is kind of the core model. So uh, there's a lot, a lot of things where we're seeing a lot of innovation in the industry. We're seeing lots of things such as eventually consistent value stores when they're distributed. To river, it takes a while for those updates to propagate. There's things like hierarchical key value stores, or key value stores that you store uh, within uh, uh, hard disk or just or uh, in, in just installed state drives. Um, there are folks, some of them are focused on high availability, um, and some, some of them do allow list separation. Uh, the uh, values of that system. So they're not true key value stores. Most of these systems uh, allow you to do sub queries, but they don't support a full query language. Give you a little example of this, um, and that's the memcache system. Memcache uh, was one of the very early open source uh, key value stores. And what it was created was by a group called uh, LiveJournal, and LiveJournal had this problem in that. Uh, users were coming to their uh, site and read the same data over and over, and they had different web servers, and they figured out cache data in each web server. But sometimes uh, you'd, you'd have duplication of the data in each of those caches. So what they did was they came up with a very simple way to allow these RAM caches to share uh, key values. And they have a simple protocol. So you can say, uh, I'm a, I'm a, I've received a request for this data item. Uh, here's the item. Does any of my neighboring caches have it? Oh, yes, self has it and returns it uh, out of memory. So it avoided all those disk access. So MEMS was a very good example of a simple key value store uh, that made a big difference. Back is a good example of a key value store. Um, and uh, it's uh, created by a company called Bash. Show um, off on the East Coast. React is another example of what we call a dynamo inspired. Amazon paper called DynamoDB quite a while, and um, it is a lot of different uh, organizations. 
And the key thing about these systems is they, they really focused on high availability and fault tolerance. You may have a cluster of 10 nodes. If any one or sometimes two of those nodes fail, uh, they know how to duplicate the data. The data was replicated automatically for you. Uh, if a cluster failed, it would automatically uh, auto shard and add new things if there was uh, additional data. Um, and they also integrate with a lot of these high uh, volume transformation tools like MapReduce. And then they also support storing full text search uh, on some of those things. Really interesting because it is written in Erlang. Erlang is a functional programming language. And it really takes the burden of distributing these queries around a, a potentially fault tolerant network, network uh, and makes, makes the job really easy. So we'll see a lot of different uh, systems in the NoSQL space that are written in these uh, languages like, like Erlang. Redis has a little bit different uh, spin on this one. Uh, Redis has a focus on high speed reads and writes, and they're focusing mostly on in memory key value stores. Uh, also give you a much larger palette of queries that you can do inside those values, such as lists and, and hashes, uh, and a lot of different features uh, that developers really like, like automatically expiring things after a certain time. They support transactions. They even have these mini queuing systems where you can subscribe or, pub uh, pub sub subscribe or publish uh, for different um, types of documents and different applications. So it's a very uh, a good example of a, a NoSQL a key store that's gone in a different direction. Uh, and DynamoDB, as I mentioned earlier, is one of the uh, earlier uh, architectures, and it just didn't become available as, as a service until last year. Um, and you could actually go to Dynamo uh, Amazon and, and sign up for a Dynamo uh, system, and uh, it gives you a lot of the benefits of cloud-based storage. You don't have to worry about it. Um, uh, it's Amazon's uh, fastest growing product. Interesting that Dynamo is strictly designed to work on solid state drives. And uh, they designed this because they want to guarantee the number of reads and writes per second, even though you're scaling or may have huge peaks in demands uh, at very short times. Uh, they focus on throughput and not necessarily storage and have very strong integration with Amazon's other products like the Amazon S3 system and the uh, Electric uh, MapReduce. Now let's go on to column family stores, uh, or the second major pattern. And uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, I think of a uh, column family store as a grid of uh, keys uh, where, we, where the key is composed of the row and the column, and the value is kind of stored as a blob. Uh, most of the column family stores are a little bit more mature than simple key value stores. Uh, but they have the same limitations, but also some more uh, advanced features. Examples uh, of column family stores would, in, would include Cassandra, uh, HBase, uh, Hybel, uh, Apache Accumulo, which has gotten a lot of press because it's the system used by the NSA uh, and has very high um, uh, security and fine-grained control. And then the original Amazon Bigtable uh, all use column family stores. I would mention really quickly that Many people confuse these things called column fam family stores with a variation of an analytical database, which is a column-oriented store. Column-oriented store still stores things like an OLAP cube, uh, but instead, it, instead of grouping all the data in a row together, it groups data in a column together. That's been more of an implementation. The, the model you use for uh, um, column-oriented databases is SQL. Uh, it has pretty much the same. It has changed the storage uh, patterns. Uh, but column stores are really unique, um, and uh, they are really the chance at a lot of scale out, and uh, they have multiple versioning, so you can have multiple versions of each blob in each cell. Uh, they're really the primary choice for a lot of people that are doing uh, harvesting. So you have a new version of a website, you just, just put it uh, in the same cell, and the uh, URL might be the uh, row ID, and the column might uh, describe that version of that uh, web page. Um, the only problem with this is, you, just like key value stores, you can't really query any of the content in the blob. So you would be pretty careful about designing uh, and putting the data in the right uh, uh, section. Uh, and it doesn't have to be just binary blob data. You can have lots and lots of small data and millions of uh, different column names, um, and you just don't, you won't have the ability to do the same types of queries. 
although a lot of people are starting to build SQL and SQL like length uh, to these systems. Uh, so um, these big table systems could be used on very large systems. Uh, I think a, a typical, the minimal H base you see in production is usually about seven nodes minimum. Um, and so uh, they have uh, uh, redundancy built in, they have automatic rep replication, they're often tightly coupled with MapReduce. Um, many of them use the Hadoop distributed file system, HDFS, which has replication by default of three. So every time you store, it needs to store it on three different nodes. Um, although you can certainly do, do testing and development on a, on a single laptop. This is really uh, one of those systems where uh, people have a lot of data and they a they little bit more flexibility in the key value store and they also want to scale out. But also have this um, a mental model of a table that still tends to work well uh, because you are kind of looking at a, a, a grid layout a lot of these things. You can't do the, the traditional things. Have some query languages. Uh, such as pig and um, uh, and the HBase uh, languages. Um, so you, well, I visualize this is if you you see the spreadsheet of having a key, which is a combination of the row and the column letter. Uh, we can think of a uh, a big table storage as kind of like that, except the key has a little bit more information. It has not just uh, the row uh, identifier, but it also has a column family, kind of a grouping of, of columns, as well as the column name, just like a column name in a relational database. It also has timestamps, so you can store multiple versions, and you'll have that value. Okay. So um, the uh, column family store uh, is uh, nice because you can keep adding more and more data and you can keep it making it more distributed um, and it allows you to uh, continue to add uh, more data as, as your systems grow. Uh, families really allow you to group things together uh, and allow people to do other output um, and still adding such as uh, triggers that happen on certain things. So there are a lot of different questions of this that go on. When you think of column families, I like to think of a tree. And when you're starting to think of this, you have this, many of the systems have this concept of per columns and column families. And then you're putting your data into certain columns underneath that. Um, designing this nice system is, is similar in some ways to designing uh, hierarchical documents. But it's also similar in some ways to, to the traditional models where you're going to be having uh, columns that have similar data and similar structures. The systems that implement these column families are systems like the HBase system, uh, and popular, originally created by Yahoo, and uh, has a huge amount of development that has gone into this. Uh, they all have uh, Java interfaces. They run through Java uh, JVMs, um, and uh, they have strong support from a lot of different vendors, including Hortonworks and Cloudera and uh, MapR and uh, now Intel and uh, Greenplum are also very, uh, and IBM are also very active in this area. Uh, one of the biggest uh, successes in the table uh, company stores uh, is the Cassandra system. Uh, Cassandra, uh, which is uh, an open source Apache product, but also supported by the company data um, has a very interesting, uh, instead of a, 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 a uh, master play model, they have a full what's called peer-to-peer -peer distribution. This is wonderful for people that are scaling out uh, because each node in the network in the cluster has almost a full set of the data it needs to keep running. Um, if multiple nodes fail, um, it automatically recovers. There's no single point failure. Uh, and uh, Cassandra and, and data have done very, very well uh, recently with a lot of good information and a lot of good um, uh, uh, support and monitoring. Um, and they've taken a lot of business away from some of the bigger uh, relational databases. Uh, Cassandra is also written in Java and, and works very well in a slight version of the HDFS, but also have integration points with the standard HDFS and MapReduce. One of the uh, slides that I wanted to, to highlight is uh, one that uh, Adrian 
Jim Cockcroft did at our conference last year, and who will be a keynote this year at the conference. And uh, uh, Netflix has done an amazing job with Cassandra at um, uh, helping people understand how to build tools that will scale out and prove that these tools scale out. Facebook, what they do is they set up an infrastructure where you can lease um, 200 nodes in an Amazon cluster, well, in this one, 288 uh, large instances. Um, and simulate a load of up to a million transactions per second yeah. um, and simulate for about an hour and then shut it all down to show that these systems really do scale. Um, uh, creating uh, these benchmarks requires a lot of infrastructure that Netflix has not only created but also made uh, open source. And uh, I think Adrian is one of the best, uh, best speakers around and really talks about how uh, this peer architecture that underlies Cassandra has really been a great uh, benefit for a lot of uh, companies that need super high scalability. Um, so we're going to move on to graph stores now. Uh, graph stores is when we start to focus on relationships uh, and the properties of those relationships. Uh, examples of these include uh, Neo4j, one of the biggest ones, uh, Google Graph, um, uh, and Infinite Graph, uh, and several of the uh, RDF triple stores are all types of graphs. Um, the interesting thing that's different about graph stores is that when you do queries, you really are not looking at these uh, projections, uh, you know, giving a subset of these nodes, but starting to do uh, things that are almost looking like you're walking uh, through the graph. They call them graph traversals. Um, and they are very, very fast when you want to search networks, uh, and they uh, are very good at uh, pulling in publicly linked data. Uh, the disadvantage of graphs is really in the you have with the virtual one that because they have so many relationships, just like relational databases, when you have graphs that need to span multiple nodes in a network, they really need to share uh, data across these nodes, and so you get a slowdown if, if these queries all don't go uh, RAM. They also have very specialized uh, languages. Um, a lot of the RDF databases use Sparkle, uh, which is a W3 standard for these queries. So in these graph stores, it's really when you have a great understanding of the focus on relationships, the types of relationships between data. Uh, fantastic for social network, networking queries. Uh, how friends of mine have friends that have visited this restaurant, or how many uh, friends live in the area that have uh, these uh, properties. Uh, they're also very useful for uh, likely inference and rules engineering. They're heavily used in pattern recognition, uh, fraud detection. Uh, our book has a case study on um, YARC data. You take Cray and uh, spell it backwards. You have YARC, uh, Cray, and um, they have a hardware box that has huge, massive terabyte scale uh, set of them. And then they do uh, uh, thousands of processes, all doing graph traversals on the centralized uh, range. Uh, and so they can really scale up to the uh, terabytes of uh, graphs. Um, and they can, uh, and these systems can really be doing, used for uh, uh, Medicaid uh, fraud and a lot of other discovery uh, where uh, you're looking for these complex patterns in these graphs. So how these systems work? Well, most of these systems, uh, when they merge data together, they require that you know, identify a node with some kind of unique identifier. In this case, uh, the example is you have two nodes, uh, and they're joined by uh, a node that has the same identifier, uh, person one, two, three. So then you can almost do inference, and you can ask the question, uh, do any books have the name of Dan, uh, just by joining two disparate data sets together. Uh, the key is, how do you make sure your nodes have the same name? That's how a lot of organizations are starting to use uh, UIs for that. Uh, you can see that there's a lot of data uh, out there. Uh, this is one of the uh, pictures from uh, the people that are connecting databases. Each of these circles is, in fact, a database. And some of them are uh, media data. Some of them, the yellow in the lower left, are geographic data. Upper right is more publication type data. Life Sciences uh, is down, down in the lower right. And all of these uh, data sets are designed to have uh, similar things called Sparkle endpoints. 
uh, these points allow you to, in a sense, take uh, a array, send it to them, and get a graph out of it. Uh, DBP is kind of in the center of this uh, graph because they have a lot of links. And uh, the big news that happened just recently is that Wikipedia has now taken over a lot of the uh, job of managing uh, these links to have consistent links and rule checks. The data Wikipedia is used as a lot of source uh, for this link data. Uh, one of the most popular systems for this is the database uh, Neo4j. Neo4j has really gotten a, a big uh, percentage of the graph market because they have real appeal to the developer. Um, and they, uh, it's an open source, although they do have a, a supported version, um, and they have things like acid transactions. Um, and so people have often built these small Neo4j uh, databases uh, and, and done specific queries and then integrated them with their other systems. So they may not be doing all of their uh, storage and retrieval and search uh, off of Neo4j, but they certainly have done a lot of them. On to our last one, which is document stores. And document stores is kind of the darling of the, the venture capital area. There's a lot of funding going into this. And this is the area where you're starting to store your data into nested hierarchies. Um, you put logical data together. So for example, a sorter would all be represented in one tree. Uh, and uh, examples of these companies would be MarkLogic, uh, Mongo, Couchbase, uh, CouchDB, and uh, one, one that I use almost every day is ExistDB. The key advantage of this is that you don't have to have this object relational layer. They're really uh, very compelling for search. Um, they are a little bit more complicated to implement because of uh, their query languages, uh, and they aren't necessarily compatible with a lot of the SQL. Um, they use path expressions uh, rather than the SQL queries, but they also uh, have been associated with a lot of the accelerated development. So. Uh, there are two major subtypes of document stores, both JSON and XML, um, and they really are kind of similar to the old object stores that we used to see. They're storing your uh, a sized version of an object and all the objects that contain those objects all under the same structures. Uh, they are very uh, quickly maturing to add a lot of more, lot more features. You're starting to see more support for acid transactions um, and a lot more um, revenue coming into the companies uh, as they get funded. Uh, here's a little uh, chart showing in red here um, some of the companies that are really focused uh, completely on um, NoSQL systems. Uh, and I wanted to point out that MarkLogic, uh, KenGen, and Couchbase, uh, KenGen is the company behind Mongo, uh, are all uh, uh, some of the biggest leaders. And now, uh, this graph shows that they're still tiny compared to the revenue of the big companies that are doing support and service, uh, but starting to see a lot more of these document store uh, models become very popular. So why is this uh, important? If you, let's look at this uh, problem of moving data in and out of relational databases. Um, this is what I call the four transformation model, where you have four different transforms that have to occur. Uh, getting data out of your web page in one format, put them into your object middle tier, Java or .NET, then doing the transformation, um, and T2 and T3 are usually done automatically for you um, by Hibernate and some of the object relational mapping, OR mapping tools. Um, they get it out of the object, put it back into serialize uh, into uh, HTML. So key thing about, about the document models is that you don't need to do this, uh, and especially if you have web services where you need to uh, send data back and forth, you'll have to build more transforms out of your objects. Um, a lot of people have called this transformation layer the, kind of the, the VM of applications, this, this quagmire that you get stuck into. Many projects get lost, and getting in and out of the relational database becomes the most important problem uh, rather than solving your business problem. Uh, stores uh, can store the documents in this app application layer. If you're building in the web browser, uh, you might just do one call to your document store store and pull an entire JSON object that populates all of your web browser information. Um, they're complex middle tier. There's no shredding. There's no reassembly. Uh, really simple. Uh, the things that I have done a lot of is work in XML standards, a lot of work forms. And XForm has a model where the data is all in an XML structure. 
Um, you hit the Save button, it goes directly to the database. Some kind of code, you could save that into your uh, native XML database. Um, and with one uh, uh, REST query, you can rebuild all the data in your forms. Um, so the translation, um, the native XML database places by their three queries, the REST makes it much easier to build and maintain. So stores are kind of the champion of this thing called schema free. Schema free, you have to do data modeling beforehand. Um, you don't have to know much about your data. You just uh, receive data. There's metadata inside that, uh, and that metadata all builds up the indexes. So you can load data, and then you can still validate it. There's still a concept of schema validate data, but you don't know it before you do your modeling. The free systems are also very nice when you're integrating multiple versions of the same set of data. Those documents don't really care if there's those extra uh, elements in there. Uh, they just absorb them anyway, and then you can do the queries on the data uh, that is consistent. Uh, so a lot of companies that are starting to adopt these because they have such dynamic systems that are changing uh, so frequently. Well, upfront modeling means you don't have to decide exactly how data is going to be structured. This can be a very time-consuming process, and you need to get it right up front before you start these things because you can't load data until after your data definition language is written. This is one of the reasons that agility has really gone up in many. Um, I should mention that you still have data modeling tools. This is a tool of an XML schema diagram that's done with a tool oxygen that we use uh, quite a bit. Pretty easy to read. You can see that the uh, black solid lines here at the top uh, kind of represent um, uh, a required field. Uh, the the uh, uh, thin lines are optional fields, data types. You can see the cardinality here. The different uh, detail directly in this, and uh, you can teach business analysts how to models to to modify to uh, validate data and check that it's consistent. Um, there's other tools that actually build these schemas directly from the sample data. We're inferring the structure of the schema from the instances. Um, the company is often associated with uh, uh, the large-scale XML databases is MarkLogic. Uh, they've been around for a long time. They have a lot of the uh, enterprise scalable features, ACID compliance. Um, a lot, they're uh, heavily used by federal agencies as well as document publishing and organizations that have high quality data. We have two case studies for MarkLogic in our book uh, from uh, financial industry and the publishing industry. So definitely uh, one of the most successful companies. But one of the means I think that has gotten more modern and much more visible is the Mongo database, uh, the open source uh, JSON data store created by Tengen. Um, it uses a very powerful master-slave distri distribution model. They have a fantastically strong developer that done a great job at building alliances and party relationships. They have uh, uh, a and automatic uh, movement of data, uh, and people seem to like it because it's so familiar to the JSON data stores that they that they like. Um, and they have a lot of different languages, so you're not really focused on the query language uh, directly, whatever running uh, system that you want. Uh, Copbase is the one that has really started to come behind, from behind. Uh, they used to be a simple key value store, but just in their uh, latest release, uh, later have had a full document store. Um, and they've also been very, very good at having that scalability and high availability uh, system. So written in Erlang and a lot of the nice features of high availability systems. Uh, I just make sure that everybody knows that CouchDB is a very different product than CouchBase. CouchDB is the original Apache project out of the people left uh, and working for CouchBase, but they have a, almost a completely different uh, source code base now. They are both written in Erlang, um, and uh, CouchDB uh, has a lot of other systems uh, that they're going after. A lot of gamers are using it, um, and they have uh, companies that support distributed JSON uh, stores uh, on the world for a very fast and scalable uh, system. They also have small versions that uh, have uh, use of the databases that run on your cell phones, so it's easy to sync those up. So, uh, and I just wanted to mention Exist. 
uh, it doesn't get a lot of pub publicity in the U.S., but it's a very big digital humanities area. Uh, it's an open source native XML database that has strong support for XQuery, and uh, a lot of people are using it for uh, doing queries on annotated data, uh, things that uh, where you have people, places, and dates all uh, annotated. So a lot of nice features, uh, but certainly not targeting the same scalability issue. Uh, one of the things to mention about uh, document stores is uh, they allow you to retain structure. When you retain structure, uh, you can then do uh, search where keywords that appear in a title, for example, might go directly to the top of a search result page. So it's easier to implement high precision uh, search and retrieval things using document stores. Uh, you have a, a hierarchy of documents, and you can have different rules for every ID uh, for ranking that search results. Um, and uh, to wrap up, you'll find that, that there's no one, one system out there. There's a lot of different uh, architectures that are combinations. You might document stores. You might use uh, key stores. You might use search and retrieval. You might use MapReduce. You might use OLAP for reporting. They can all work together. This is not uh, an all or nothing uh, prospect. Uh, to clip, I just wanted to mention some tools to help you pick out the right systems. Uh, we really spent a lot of time in our book in the last chapter going through this. Uh, this is the Carnegie Mellon architecture trade-off and money process. They're both your business drivers and your architectural op op options together in a parallel path, and then do process, and that comes out with a lot of different options for you. Uh, we go a lot of work in our processes to help understand to effort. So in this case, you can see there's a uh, insert query and publish. Uh, we add them all up, and we can help analyze which of these architectures might be best for a certain type of thing. We build these things called uh, utility quality attribute trees uh, that talk about how useful each system is, and we can score those based on things. And we have even released some open source software on GitHub uh, that helps use uh, uh, X to build your quality trees. So to close up and open it for questions, um, our, our book is available at Manning. Uh, Anna and I would really love to hear from people about what topics they're interested in. Um, and with that, I think we're going to open it up for questions. Um, and uh, um, Dan, uh, let me do a quick uh, sound check again, given some of the, the audio problems we've had on the broadcast today. Um, you can hear me fine, I think. You're just fine, Tony. Okay. Let me just mention to everybody, given the number of questions, the, the slides and the recordings will be distributed. This is the recording is available from WebEx, which is generally within uh, four to forty-eight hours. So we'll be distributing that to everybody who is registered. Uh, we have numerous, um, relatively short, short uh, questions here. Um, one is uh, touched on seen towards the very end of your your rotation there. Would you consider Lucene and Solar examples of key value stores? Not quite, uh, although uh, I have to say that uh, Solar is starting to really become a very strong NoSQL solution. But I think it's more a cl closely related to a document store. Um, but what we really focus on is uh, indexing uh, uh, documents. Um, so the okay. document then key value store. But I can see the similarities. Okay. Certainly, um, you know, part of the overall NoSQL picture and integrated with a lot of other solutions, I think, is the the that you were getting at in your slide there. Right, yeah. Um, it's often part of a, uh, 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 other projects uh, for the full text retrieval. Both, uh, almost all the NoSQL products have integration points with uh, Lucene and Solar. Right. Uh, now, there are a couple of questions about ACID and, and whether you see ACID being incorporated into NoSQL technologies in the near future. And, and again, you sort of addressed this as you went through the presentation, but um, I'm, I'm going to just assume that, that part of this question comes from uh, people who looked at products like Mongo, for example, which, which do not provide ACID support. Do you see it coming into various NoSQL solutions in the near future? That's, that's a good point. Um, I, I do want to say that Mongo uh, does have a variation of ACID that is uh, in store documents. Uh, your, if you make a series of changes within the same document, you'll have any of the benefits of ACID uh, 
committal in that. It's only when you're doing multiple changes in multiple documents that that doesn't come out of the box. Of course, there are other ways to do that within your application. Um, so you can still get the same benefits from a NoSQL database for reliable transactions. Um, most of these NoSQL products um, have uh, something called base or basically available uh, systems. And what they allow you to do is tune how many uh, uh, servers will respond uh, to get a consistent result. And, uh, so what, you're, what you end up doing is you're going to be using different types of APIs for a simple begin and end transaction in SQL. Uh, you're going to be uh, using parts of their APIs to make sure you're getting consistent, reliable things. Um, any of these systems also support uh, advanced features like cross data center replication. So you can say, if you have two data centers, one on the East Coast and the West Coast, don't respond to the user until you get a right response from both data centers. And things are much harder to tune in some relational databases. Um, so I think what you what you're see is different ways of getting reliability and high availability. Um, certainly some of the newest NoSQL products don't have that ACID commits. Tool systems like um, MarkLogic uh, have had ACID commits. Uh, for a long time. Uh, and so it really depends on your budget, how much you're willing to pay for commercial licenses, how much willing, uh, time you're willing to spend uh, having application developers make sure you put in that. Uh, I do think the most important number to remember is that only about 5% of transactions really need to have absent guarantees. And so in a project, uh, you can focus your developers on those and get around some of these problems. So Applications uh, uh, that really do need transactions, relational databases might still be the right way to go. Sure. Uh, there's a question here about whether you see any relational uses, uh, data warehouses, for example, or OLTP systems upgrading uh, to NoSQL. And, and if not, why not? Uh, yeah, I do see um, some of these large systems I think, migrating to NoSQL. Because of their scalability, um, uh, a lot of these NoSQL systems have very sophisticated ways of doing hashes and looking at uh, the hash values as algorithms for doing reliable distributions over clusters. And they seem to not have the same number of failure points as, but also have the scalability. Um, they, they haven't yet added the automatic aggregation of automatically compute sums and totals that these uh, very mature OLAP products do. Uh, I think you're starting to see some of the benefits uh, in these larger systems as they add more aggregate features. What people really want is they want fast results and sums and totals uh, of things. And each of these main NoSQL database uh, vendors are starting to add those already, as well as uh, allowing other systems to, to in effect, send um, uh, standard reporting systems like OLAP to an interface that looks uh, similar to a, a relational uh, ODBC interface, but the back end really is a NoSQL system. Okay. Um, uh, there's a question here that uh, so just made no mention of D2. Uh, I'm wondering, isn't IBM implementing NoSQL functionality uh, on the Mongo model? Kind of a complicated question. Um, IBM has had a native XML uh, version, or uh, an, an XML uh, version of D2 since uh, DB2 version 9, uh, where they store large XML documents and it immediately indexes it, and they also support a subset of the full X query uh, system. Um, so I would say that's kind of true, that I, IBM does have a lot of the document store models that Mongo has, what they do have that uh, that MarkLogic and Exist and some of these other uh, companies that are supporting the JSON and query link is a really nice, easy, transparent way uh, for developers um, to uh, store and retrieve their JSON uh, objects without ever having to go through the hoops of SQL and object relational mapping. Uh, most of the object relational tools don't yet work clean with the stored in IBM DB2. Uh, and and if, if, if that's changed, uh, please let me know. But last time I looked at it, um, you couldn't get Hibernate to automatically store your, your JSON directly into the blobs. Um, 
And so the object relation mapping was, wasn't as elegant, but I think IBM is certainly moving in that direction and has seen some of the benefits of these uh, JSON document stores. Right. I think our folks uh, can be making some announcements in this uh, shortly as well. Um, there's uh, uh, three for other questions here. We'll try to keep them sh short shop. Um, uh, it's possible to get a little more discussion on the difference between a graph or map model versus a document model. Yeah, you I, you know, I, the thing is that they both have nodes that are in structures. Uh, graphs really allow for very large interconnected things, whereas documents really kind of, I think, of our complex structures that are more leaves on trees that can have lookups between other documents. That may be kind of a, a subtle difference, uh, but document stores are really uh, ideal for naturally related documents, whereas graphs are, are much more about uh, chaotic data that may be coming off the Internet that has no relationships. Okay, good, or, or good short answer on a complex subject. Uh, <laughs> you mentioned that data modeling. Pardon me, Dan? I'm sorry, go ahead, Tony. The data modeling is not on a critical path to populating NoSQL stores. Uh, is it required at some point at all? Uh, and if so, in what way? You know, it all depends on what you're using it for and how important it is for you to have uh, what I call canonicalized data, which is very, very consistent data. Um, we, you certainly don't have to do it beforehand, but if you really have business rules where certain objects have to have certain constraints and rules and relationships, um, then you are going to start to want to do data modeling. Uh, and the, I think the key is that you just have so many different options, different ways of doing it in document stores, uh, whereas you're kind of forced to do it up front if you're going to use relational data databases. Okay. Uh, and this is a bit of a trick question, but uh, the question asks, is the industry standard no school product for each use case? Look for a quick, a way, a quick choice from the CB something products available today. Uh, let's say it's actually a higher number than that. But, uh, yeah, 120. Is this, a model? Is this um, a reference model for matching business requirements to products? There is no one uh, pushed model that I know of. Um, what we do as consultants is we have a series of best practices, a series of if-then-else rules, and we have a process of taking people through that using the Carnegie Mellon ATEM process. And, and you saw some of these rules in, in the presentation. You saw that search is really critical, and you want to rank uh, titles of documents higher, that you need to retain the structure, and that document stores are important. So uh, what I see, what I say is it's probably about uh, two to three hundred ifs and else statements that uh, help you rank different things, um, and the, the formal requirements process will help you answer those questions, and then to rank different architectures first, and then once you have an architecture, then you can start to look into products that have certain features that are important for you, and that's really what uh, the consulting business around this NoSQL uh, match is, and that's really what the solutions architecture groups of these new companies uh, that are having the diversity uh, are really trying to focus on, is understanding those rules in the context of a certain situation. It will become much of these questions at the conference in August. Well, I think that's all that we have for today, Dan. I'd like to thank you very much. I'd like to we also thank our audience for persevering through some awkward issues. Um, we will be distributing both the slides and the uh, links to the recording uh, within the next couple of days and as soon as that is available. Um, we will also be in contact with somebody shortly uh, who has won a free ticket to the NoSQL Now conference in August. So we'll be doing that drawing after the event today. I thank everybody for attending today's webinar. Uh, thank you again, Dan, for contributing your expertise today, and uh, we hope to uh, see you all soon on the next in our series on NoSQL. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Thanks, Tony.